The ambulance service in Essex serves a population of 1.6 million people and the county's crews provide cover across nearly one and a half thousand square miles. Harlow-based ambulance technician Colin Wilson is at the wheel responding to an emergency 999 call. His crew partner is paramedic Neil Peachy. We're on our way now to an 80-year-old gentleman who has activated his emergency call in his house, which uh, alerts the social services that he has a problem. He has a history of diabetes and he's generally feeling unwell. Their first challenge is how to get into the building. He's 31 here. After that, it's how to get into the patient's flat. Don't worry, all our neighbours, they'll be ringing us up, they'll be all right. We need to get into this one, that's the problem. A few weeks ago it was a farm and up here all hours of the night. Is there a key holder anywhere in the area? Is there like a warden or anything? And they all told me no. No, they didn't come in here, you might have to turn his window. Okay, mate. You can't see through the curtain. All right, don't worry, mate. With no response from the inside and no idea as to the man's condition, Neil yeah, calls right. for help. All closed up. Uh, gentleman's not answering the door, uh, and uh, there's no one here to let us in. If we feel that their patient may be at risk, we can call for police backup, uh, and uh, they will then come along and forcibly enter the premises. If uh, in very rare occasions we can actually see that the patient is in a compromised state, then we may, and it's very rare, make that decision ourselves. And apparently there is a relative on the way down who has some keys, so hopefully we'd better gain access and find out what's going on there. A lot of the elderly people, they have systems in place uh, where if they have an accident at home, they have uh, a button or a pull cord that they pull, uh, and then they rely on uh, a number of different agencies to, to get together to allow you access. Are you the sister, are you? All right. <laughs> we'll let ourselves in. OK. Ha-ha. Oh, you won't Here we go. He's stuck in the bath. That's why he can't get out. What are you doing in there? It soon becomes apparent why Stan was unable to answer the door. Lovely. That's what I like to hear. I'm just... Bloody can't get out of the Right. One, two, three. Oh. oh, thank you very much, dear. And that's very nice of me. Anyway. That's all right. Let's go and see if we can sit you down Let's go somewhere. and sit you down and then check you over, make sure you're all right. Yeah, I'm OK. I got in the bath. I'm in the building. I couldn't fucking get out. <laughs> Never mind. Oh, Never mind. Oh. What did you, how did you fall in the toilet? Did you just sort of like lose know. your balance? I don't bloody know. <laughs> have you been drinking? Have you had a drink? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. Stan may only be suffering from drinking one too many, but as he's a diabetic, Neil takes the precaution of monitoring his blood sugar. I'm sorry about all this. That's OK, 6.3. Neil is satisfied that Stan doesn't need emergency medical attention, but he does offer a word of advice. And if you're going to have a bath, put water in it. Yeah. Okay, we'll leave you with your uh, your sister, and she's going to sort you out something to eat. Yeah. Oh, well. Lovely jobs to do. It's like he's not hurt himself, is he? He's really innocently. He's just fell in a bath. He's been down a pub. He's had a bit too much to drink. He's fell in a bath, and he's just like laughs. He's laughing about the whole thing, and I think they're great jobs. I think they're really. <laughs> Their next 999 emergency call is to another elderly patient. Getting there quickly is paramount, particularly if you're the waiting patient, but blue light runs can be fraught and demand every ounce of concentration from Colin. There's always an adrenaline rush when you're driving. Um, you have to watch what everybody else is doing and you have to drive for them as well as yourself. People stop in front of you, um, pull up shop, you get other people that sort of stop opposite each other and you've got to try and squeeze through the gap in the middle. Um, it, it can be hair raising at times and it, you know, it's one error of, of judgment, you know, and you've uh, you've pranged it. <laughs> well, have you fell out of the bed, or have you just fell out, tripped over onto the I floor? Fell out, I fell out of the bed. Right. Okay. It turns out that John has fallen face forward no, onto the floor. Right. We need you to roll over onto your back now. Roll over onto your oh, back now. Arm, John is very typical of uh, a lot of the calls that we go to. He's elderly, he's unable to cope on his own, uh, he's taken a fall, and because of his uh, medical condition, he's not allowed to, to, to get onto his own two feet on his own. 
uh, he requires us to someone to pick him up. He did have a full-time care with him, but it's a lot to ask one person to pick up. And he was actually quite a big man. Here we go. Fantastic. Right, we need to make sure because you're sitting not you're not sitting. You're very precarious, aren't you? You're sitting quite precariously on that bed there. Yeah, that's that's our word of the day. We're trying to squeeze that. You're not sitting up, you silly arse. I don't believe it, honestly. God blame me. We're going We'll try and squeeze that word in on the paperwork somewhere. Yeah. Those calls are uh, like a, an assist and assessment type call. We have assisted him to his feet, we've assessed him, he has no injuries, he's in full time care, he doesn't want to go to hospital, I'm happy with that. So we, we're quite happy to leave him. As day turns to night, events take a more serious turn. As far as we're aware, we're going to a gentleman who's complaining, he's basically generally unwell, complaining of pains in his arms, query calls. Right then, I guess it's you because you're lying down on the sofa. Yes, Tell me what's been going on then. Sweating like a pig, my arms all like pins and needles. Have you got any pains anywhere else at all? Michael is clearly in considerable discomfort. Neil needs to quickly find the cause of the problem if he's to provide the much needed relief. Because they normally give that to uh, patients with angina. Well, that's right. Well, right. he has got angina. Got angina. Oh, right. so, that's all so you have angina? Well, yes. yes. I think we're out yes. of chair. The problem with high blood pressures of that type is that they can then lead on to further problems. If he has any weaknesses, particularly in his blood vessels around his brain or around his heart or, or any minor, they, they could rupture and then that could lead to further problems. I want you to think about five stone. Think like right. thoughts. Think. All right. Yeah. One, two, three. Up. Only three stone. That's good, lad. That's what we want you to think. With no lift available, Colin and Neil must now carry Michael down three flights of stairs. Morning, fella. While Colin sets about taking Michael's blood pressure, Neil prepares to carry out an ECG or electrocardiogram. This is a readout of the electric currents associated with heartbeats. Right, it makes it easy pain, to see if there are abnormalities. Right, we're just going to pop you on these. In the 20 years that Neil and Colin have been working for the ambulance service, advances in both facilities and training have transformed the way they work. The training has progressed so much that because we are now able to uh, treat uh, a certain amount of cases we go to actually in the house, once we've arrived on the scene, effectively the emergency is over. It just gives us a much clearer picture, that's all. The ECG is normal, but Neil and Colin are taking Michael to hospital for further investigations to find out why his blood pressure is so high. They'll probably do all the same tests again in A&E, they'll probably do blood tests as well, just to rule anything out. But uh, obviously he clearly has a problem with his blood pressure. That will then be passed down to his GP to sort out. Michael left hospital after further tests and a change of medication. It's now late into the evening and the next 999 emergency call is to a crime scene. Yeah, we're going to an assault outside of someone's house, uh, local. Don't know, quite know what it is yet, but uh, we've just arrived, so. Did anyone see what happened at all? Residents happened? in a quiet it's suburb well. have been woken by the violent sounds of an assault. But he's beating them up. OK. Did the bottle. All right, mate, it's the ambulance. How are you feeling? All right, they just keep nice and still for me. Lying there in the dark, it's hard to tell just how seriously Rob is injured. From what the, they were telling us, he'd been hit round the head with a, with a glass bottle. Well, I mean, that, that's a very heavy object and can cause quite significant damage. He'd also been kicked and stamped whilst he'd been lying on the floor. All right, there. He's got uh, what appears to be a laceration down on his right-hand side of his head. The head contains one of the most important organs in the body, which is the brain. And you don't know what's going on. You don't know what any underlying damage is, as, as the injury fractured his skull. It's a matter of just getting him into hospital as quick as you can, where they can scan him and make sure that, uh, that he's fine. So can I take your blood pressure off? The increase in this type of assault, where knives or broken bottles have been used, has forced the ambulance service in Essex to rethink staff safety and issue stab vests, like those worn by the police. Yeah, I think he might have fractured his jaw. Normally, we would have backup from the police, and the police would go in first to give us that element of protection. But, but if we do get caught in circumstances where we are on our own, we now at least have 
uh, an element of protection. Rob remained under observation in hospital for four days, but remarkably escaped his ordeal with only minor injuries. For Neil and Colin, it's time to return to base and go off shift. We follow up on, on many of our cases that we do, especially if they're interesting. We'll, we'll ask, you know, what happened to them uh, and uh, what the outcome was. You know, you can build up your knowledge that way. I've lived and worked in Harlow all my life and it's just me giving something back to the people in the town to some degree. Well, it ends well. <laughs> Luton Fire Station and White Watch parade prior to going on duty. The 15 men and one woman are part of a team of 64 full-time firefighters based at Luton, the busiest fire station in the east of England. The familiar wailing of the alarm hastens White Watch to man the pump. They'll leave the fire station within 60 seconds of it going off. Somebody's set fire to a heap of rubbish and discarded building materials on a derelict site. Left to burn, it will shroud the nearby houses in acrid smoke. There's a lot of nasties in here. For Richard Portlock, fires like this follow a familiar pattern. We get a lot of rubbish fires, uh, a lot of bin fires, a lot of arson and things like that. Um, sort of people just fly tipping um, and then someone comes along and just torches it. That's a lot of, a lot of jobs we sort of get and skip fires and things. And step away a minute, Nick, I'll fire it from this side. I'm getting this hole here. It's obviously been here, dumped a while, just accumulated, and I think we've got it now. If you look at it, it's just steaming off a little bit, but um, I think we've got most of it. It was just deep seated, really, at, at the bottom, so that's why we had to rake it all away. To keep their skills in shape, White Watch take part in an ongoing and rigorous programme of training. The scenario for this exercise is for White Watch to hunt for casualties amongst the stores and floors of a burned out shopping centre. The training is the same for both men and women, which according to Tracy Hutchinson is just as it should be. It is a male environment, but I knew it was a male environment before I joined. As if you're just willing to do everything that everybody else does, I'll just plug in like every other, every other one of the lads. I've got my strengths, strengths and weaknesses just like everybody else's. The search teams don breathing apparatus as they would if this was a real fire. In addition to breathing apparatus, or BA, filters are attached to each face mask to simulate severely reduced visibility due to smoke. Tracy and her colleague Andy must tread carefully through what, for them, are blurred, dingy passages and rooms. The rope is used as a guideline to show the team the way out on their return journey. Team two will be led by Richard Portlock. Equipment checked, Richard and his colleague Rudy are now ready to enter the building. They use a technique known as the BA shuffle. It means that, all the time, they're feeling with their arms and legs for obstacles and hazards. If, for real, they were in dense black smoke, they'd be less likely to injure themselves or miss finding a casualty. Tracy and Andy are now deep inside the building. You got him? OK, go forward. Exertion at this level is physically and mentally punishing. When we're wearing BA is you get very hot wearing all the PPE. Um, obviously if you go into a fire situation, every part of you is covered from your 
your head with a helmet on, you've got flashed gloves on, um, so you get really hot, but all the BA drills and the training we do sort of prepares you for that. Um, and then, yeah, working hard, you're obviously going to breathe more and get hotter, and then if you find a casualty, you've got to pull them out, it's going to be even more hard work. Casualty! Keep coming! Tracy and Andy are also feeling the effects of the heat. It's very warm, but the main problem we had, because it's like such a wide open space, is a lack of tie-off points for the actual guideline. So the guideline was running free quite a fair bit, so anyone who's going to follow it at a later date might struggle because it might not be as tight, so it might get caught up on stuff. But that was our main problem that we came across. But otherwise, because there wasn't a lot of things in there, right. landmarking's a, bit, a little bit diff difficult, but as the casualty was near a landmark, it was a bit of a bonus. Now the exercise is over, Tracy would ideally like a shower back at the fire station. But with the requirement to turn out in full kit within 60 seconds of the alarm going off, she's not going to make that mistake. I have been caught once, uh, but it was for a lift stuck, so it wasn't really an emergency. Um, and I came out all soaking wet and I'd throw my gear on, it was absolutely terrible. It was a real cold day as well, I was freezing on the way to the shower. It's not unusual for drills to be interrupted by emergency calls, but on this occasion, they've completed the drill when the next call comes in. First indications suggest it's a fire which might have been started deliberately. It's a car, isn't it? it smells like it. In fact, it's a bonfire. It's just the smell of burning plastic which makes it smell like a car. Do you want to pull all that plastic off? Yeah. <coughs> I'll tell you something, you don't want a lung full of that. It's not just the burning plastic polluting the atmosphere that's causing concern. The fire is next to a railway line. The smoke will conduct the electricity and it could cause um, it to arc, which means it's a bit of a danger as well. And there was no one watching it, so it was just burning a little bit uncontrollably, so we have to extinguish it. Tackling such fires is all too common. The fire brigade's job is not just to fight fires, but educate people in how to avoid them. Luton Fire Service has been running a campaign to highlight the devastating impact of arson. It's pretty frustrating when we get sent to all the rubbish fires and bin fires, because it's not only um, a small fire, but it's taken us away from another core. There might be a house fire on the other side of town. so. They don't only set the fires, but they then throw like gas canisters on them and things like that and cans of petrol and to make it more fun, but it's obviously more dangerous to us. Two fires successfully extinguished, the next shout is to a rescue call. Special services such as rescue jobs make up around 10% of firefighters' work. In his four years' service, Richard has run the gamut of likely rescue scenarios. I really have rescued a cat from a tree and from a air conditioning shaft, um, I rescued the deer from railings, some of the other lads have had hamsters stuck in ceilings and all sorts, dogs stuck behind bars. Tonight's case is potentially more serious. We're going to a lift stuck, there's a person trapped on the sixth floor, um, we think there's an a they're an asthmatic so it's quite urgent that, that we get there as quickly as we can to get them out and get them released because we don't know what sort of condition they are inside. Sixth floor, Steve, you'll be happy to know. With the lift out of service, the only way up to the sixth floor is by the stairs. The floors didn't start until four flights of stairs up, so there's a lot of running upstairs and things like that, which all uh, takes out here. Yeah. We try and do as much fitness um, training as we can on station, sort of physical training. Um, two, three times a week, we've got a good gym here. Um, we need to try and keep fit, so obviously climbing up and down ladders and things and carrying kit about. How's your asthma feeling? Right, right, what we've got, we've got a key here. Okay, go try and get the key, slide the door open. If you feel the door moving or a car moving at all, don't worry, okay? The team are anxious to free the man as quickly as possible, but their initial attempts are thwarted. Okay, we've got the outer door open. There's two doors obviously on the lift. Uh, we've managed to open the outer door. Now we're just trying to, there's a pivot in, pivot and latch up there that we just need to try and trigger to get the inner door open. So we're almost there. Sometimes the, uh, the inner door won't release unless the, uh, the lift car is actually level. 
another approach is needed. What we need to do, we need to gain access to the uh, lift motor so we can actually wind the, wind the lift car down. It's like a braking system, you can take the brake off the lift car and then you can, uh, you can wind it down, wind it up or down. Finally, the team managed to prise open the door, revealing the cramped cubicle in which the man had endured over half an hour of incarceration. The man trapped made a quick getaway, but was grateful for his release. In Richard Portlock's experience, that's not always the case. We went to a flat fire once where we found a casualty. Um, I think he was drunk, laying on the sofa, passed out for alcohol, um, and he'd been cooking, left something on the stove. Um, we, had, we got there, flat fire smoke was issuing uh, through the seals on the door. So we had to break the door down, um, go in there, found him laying on the sofa, pulled him out, um, took him out, gave him some oxygen. Luckily, he came round again, so he wasn't, you know, he was fine. And then he had a go at us for breaking his door down. Such ingratitude, though, is rare, so the firefighters remain undeterred. I just really enjoy doing the job, so I come to work and I go home thinking, I wonder what tomorrow will turn up. You never know what's sort of around the next corner. I mean, you know, we could get a shout now any minute, or you know, we could get called out to anything. So it's always that sort of um, not knowing what you're going into and challenging job and just helping people really sort of serving the community.